Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are thrilled to be welcoming back to the show one of our favorite guests, Mr. Alice Dare McLeod. Alice Dare is the head of research at GoldMoney.com. He has been a member of the London Stock Exchange for over four decades. His expertise covers worldwide bond markets, corporate finance, investment strategies, and precious metals. We're excited to have him here on the show today to talk about everything happening right now throughout the scenes, throughout the world, this extraordinary economic time. Alastair, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you very much for asking me, Michelle. Oh, we are thrilled to have you here. Great that you're doing wonderful. Now, you're in London right now, right? Well, actually, I'm in the West Country, about 170 miles from London, but in the UK. In the UK. Okay. I want to warn everybody, we might have a little bit of bandwidth challenge, right? <laughs> That's right. I'm afraid it's one of the hazards of living in the country. There are other compensations there. <laughs> okay. Which I'm afraid you won't share. <laughs> Well, we'll take it. We will take anything we can get from you right now. I want to start off with a very interesting prediction that you have made, forecasting an inflationary depression. Please detail for everyone the difference between a recession and a depression, and what are the specific components of an inflationary depression? Okay, well, first of all, the difference between a recession and a depression. A depression is a very deep form of recession, if you like. And by that, what I mean is a contraction in the overall level of business activity. The uh, problem is measuring it. And in the days when we had gold, for example, back in the early 1930s, when the dollar effectively represented gold, it meant that prices uh, fell um, because the purchasing power of gold rose. And this was reflected, if you like, in the purchasing power of the dollar. We don't have that anymore. We have paper currencies, which are infinitely expandable. And furthermore, the central banks only know one solution to a downturn in the economy, and that is to increase the quantity of money and hope that the quantity of credit will increase as well. So monetary expansion is the primary uh, tool, if you like, that uh, the central banks use to try and get an economy to recover from a recession. Now imagine if we get a depression, then the rate of the expansion of money is that much greater. And uh, what will happen is that prices will start rising while economic activity is collapsing. So that is, if you like, the inflationary depression. Right. Now, Alastair, what is it specifically about the economy right now that is causing you to foresee that an actual depression is on the timeline? Well, the, the, the most important thing, there are two things. The first is that we have a cycle of credit, and uh, that is a cycle which is set up effectively by central bank action earlier in the cycle. And this is why you end up with um, uh, 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 an expansion of credit towards the end of the cycle, and it's always followed by a correction, a consolidation, a crash, if you like, a, um, a credit event. Uh, the last one we had was obviously the Lehman crisis, and before that we had a rather nasty situation following the bursting of the dot-com bubble under Alan Greenspan. So you can see that this is a periodic occasion, uh, sorry, occurrence. The, the, the other point I would like to make is that um, we have had um, trade protectionism rising, particularly between America and China. Now, these are the two largest single economies in the world. And when they have um, uh, trade protectionism, the introduction of tariffs, it affects everyone. And what we have seen is global trade has fallen very substantially. It's literally come to a halt. Now you look at this in shipping rates, for example, freight rates and all the rest of it. They have come way down because of the contraction of global trade. Now, this is impacting on all economies. For example, Germany's ma major client is China. 
lower activity in China, less demand for autos, means that the German economy is now in recession. And so you can see that the whole situation is interlinked. So we have a combination of the end of the expansionary phase of the credit expansion leading into a potential crisis. And that crisis, um, if you like, is proportional to the amount of credit that was injected early on. And in the wake of the uh, Lehman crisis, we have seen so much credit, money and credit injected into the US economy and indeed in the other major economies that the credit expansion has been massive. On top of that, we have got a synergistic, a nasty synergistic relationship with the contraction of trade. This leads me to suppose that we have got very similar circumstances to what occurred in 1929 to 1932, when Wall Street fell from uh, its highs in, in, at the beginning of October, uh, or September rather, 1929, to its lows in 1932, it lost 90% of its value. And uh, if you um, look back at the figures, you will see that the worst month was October 1929, when top to bottom, the market fell 35%. And that was the month when the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act, which raised the average level of tariffs in America from 38% to 60%, that was when that was passed with Congre by Congress. Ahead of it, the market collapsed. And then when it was signed into law by President Hoover um, in around, I think it was May or June 1930, then the market just went down and down and down. And it was a very, very horrid, horrid time for anyone with invested assets. And so what I'm suggesting is that we have similar um, uh, we have a similar coincidence, if you like, of tariffs in the end of the credit cycle uh, occurring today. And this is what worries me, and this is why I think that the central banks are primed to really expand the quantity of money in circulation and therefore undermine its purchasing power. Hmm. What kind of timeline do you see? Well, it's, what tends to happen is that you will get a crisis, and that suddenly, suddenly happens. Um, I can see the bones of this, perhaps, uh, we won't know until it really happens, but I'm sure that a lot of your viewers will have noticed or be aware of what's going on in the repo market. Now, the repo market is the means, if you like, from the Fed's point of view, whereby it injects liquidity into uh, the banking system. But the banking system as a whole has got plenty of liquidity. And the reason I know this is that you look at the other side of it, the, the Fed's reverse repos, they have been increasing their reverse repos, in other words, taking liquidity out of the system for the last six months or a year. So it's not a general liquidity problem. Perhaps, therefore, it is a specific liquidity problem. And there was a coincidence because when this arose, it, um, if you like, it happened at the time when the sale of Deutsche Bank's prime brokership to uh, uh, BNP, that was finally consummated at the end of September. And guess what? That is when the uh, liquidity problems in the market started. So what I can see is that um, uh, it, and this, is, this is a speculative statement, I must say, but it seems to me that it's quite likely that Deutsche Bank uh, is, it needs liquidity um, and uh, any major bank, European bank that needs liquidity is obviously in some sort of difficulty on its overall business. Now, we do know that the German banking system is under huge, great pressure. You've only got to look at the share prices of Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank Bank to see that there is a real problem there. Now, if this does, uh, um, uh, if you like, uh, escalate, then the German government is going to have to rescue those two banks or at least inject massive amounts of capital into it. Now, so we have got the beginnings perhaps, of uh, a financial crisis developing. And the first sign of it was this sudden uh, blow up in the, repo market, in the repo market, which the Fed had to intervene in order to get under control. And it's still not under control. It's continuing now. And we find that um, uh, what we now have is we have got uh, um, what effectively is QE, but we can't call it QE because the Fed says don't call it QE. And that's running at $60 billion a month. Now, come on, you know, 
what is going on? This, I think, is an indication that the whole system is under financial stress, and therefore we are at a dangerous moment. It's so interesting that it points to Deutsche Bank, because Deutsche Bank has been discussed for the past at least year that they are openly, that they are in trouble. So if you, what you saw was plenty of liquidity in the overall market, so what you're saying is this bank is in big trouble. It's also been pointed to that if it does go under, um, it's a domino effect. Well, it won't be. It won't be allowed to go under. I think is the short answer, Michelle. Um, uh, we know that it's in. We know that these German banks, major German banks, are in difficulty, and it's not helped by Mario Draghi um, increasing the negative deposit rate because uh, that, if you like, is a tax on uh, bank deposits, which so far the banks haven't been passing on to their customers. Um, and uh, they don't want to pass it on to their customers because if a bank like Deutsche Bank passes negative rates on to its customers, what happens is that the customers disappear. They go, and then the bank has got a problem. And I think that is the other end, if you like, of this liquidity crunch, which um, Deutsche Bank and Comets Bank are, are, are uh, currently facing. Let's go into your thoughts about these negative interest rates that are taking place um, in certain portions of the world. Do you think this is going to become a worldwide phenomenon, or do you think that so many customers are going to start leaving into other avenues of uh, profits and investment that the banks are going to have to um, avoid negative interest rates? What's your thought here? Well, um, it's... So far, we've got negative interest rates in Japan, um, the Eurozone, uh, Sweden, and also Denmark. Believe it or not, if, you're, if you live in Copenhagen, you can have, even have a negative interest rate mortgage now, which, which is something to conjure with. Anyway, putting that to one side, I'll, I'll try and answer your question. Um, the real problem will come if it appears that the coming recession, depression, whatever you like, slump, what, however you like to uh, describe it, if it is so serious that it forces the central banks to, uh, and particularly the Fed, to consider negative interest rates, then you have a situation where you're driving the whole of the commodity complex into backwardation from the money side. Now, this basically would mean that and the difference between the dollar and the euro is that the dollar is the reserve currency. Everything in the world is priced in dollars. It's not priced in euros. It's not priced in, in yen. So the dollar rarely matters in this respect. If you have um, uh, um, uh, backwardations in all commodities, then obviously money is going to come out of the banks and go into those commodities. So what you will see is, um, if you like, uh, uh, negative interest rates fueling uh, price inflation in commodities and also uh, semi-manufactured goods and so on and so forth. And it wouldn't take very much more for the average person to begin to think, well, I'm not getting any money while having it on deposit in the bank. Prices are beginning to rise. So actually what I ought to be doing is um, you know, buying the things that I need in advance of um, me needing them. So, you know, you've got the potential for something like a crack up boom, which is what happened at the very end of uh, the uh, German inflation in 1923. Um, and uh, the other thing, of course, is that um, uh, people will begin to think, well, what alternatives have we got to dollar money, euro money, whatever it might be? I mean, if I'm going to sell my dollars, what am I going to buy with it? And this, is, I think, is where gold comes in. Um, and this is why gold has been performing fairly well. I mean, okay, we're pausing at the moment, but I think that's perfectly natural. The thing about physical gold is very, very few people own it. Um, I mean, it's as far as portfolio managers are concerned, even, gold is not a regulated investment. So it's something they don't consider. What they will consider instead is maybe uh, investing in a gold mine, um, but the performance there has been abysmal. So, you know, fund managers buy when things have already risen, let's face it. <laughs> and, um, the other thing that they would probably deal in is futures. So you can see that uh, the demand for physical has yet really to hit the market. And uh, I think that such is the weight of money uh, as this story develops, 
that the effect on the physical price of gold when it happens, and also silver, incidentally, will be really quite dramatic. Now, Michelle, there is another thing which I think is fascinating, and we've never seen this before, and that is the invention of cryptocurrencies and how they fit into this picture. Now, cryptocurrencies, I would argue, is not, they're not really proper money. But the point is that in your part of the world, there is, um, if you like, there are, are millennials who are intelligent and understand that crypto is something exciting. They've learned about Bitcoin. And guess what? In the process, they have learned the disadvantages of state-issued unbacked currency. They understand that the reason that Bitcoin will rise is because the dollar will fall. So as soon as they see the triggers, you can see that uh, actually this is, becomes potentially quite destructive for government-issued paper currencies. Now, I think that's a fascinating new dimension, which we need to consider very, very carefully when it comes to the timing of everything that happens. Um, when you get, um, if you like, a uh, uh, a collapse in the purchasing power of a currency. Um, this tends to happen in two phases. You will get a phase which is a sort of, you know, a fairly long period because nobody wants to believe it is actually happening. Then you will get a phase where people say to themselves, my goodness, this really is happening. Our currency is going down the toilet or however you like to put it. And on that basis, they begin to get rid of it in order to car anything else. Just don't want currency. We, you know, it's you get to the situation where um, you know people will steal a wheelbarrow full of notes, dump the notes, and run away with the wheelbarrow. <laughs> so that is what happened with paper. Now, of course, it is all digital because um, so little money is actual paper. You know, we use we use credit cards, we use debit cards, and all the rest of it, and um, bank transfers and so on. Now, this has the potential to speed up the collapse of a purchasing power of the currency if the central banks are um, unwise enough to really try and use the expansion of the quantity of money in order to rescue their economy from a developing slump. So this is, this is I think, a work in progress, which all your viewers should be watching very, very carefully from that point of view. Exactly. I want to address along that lines a recent article that was released from the Dutch Central Bank. And it hinted at exactly what you're talking about, a system failure and the role of gold as the universal anchor in terms of relevance within our banking system. Some economists um, predict that the gold standard is coming while other economic experts, interestingly, say that actually there's not enough gold for that to happen. What are your thoughts? <laughs> right. Well, first, I mean, th th there are several elements to this. Um, l let me deal, deal with the last one first. The idea that there is not enough gold is complete rubbish. It's just a function of price. Gold is infinitely divisible. So um, it is just a question of price. I mean, you know, if the price is, say, $100,000 an ounce, then you have got enough money uh, for virtually everybody to use gold as money or to use paper currency fully backed by gold. In other words, it is, if you like, it represents gold uh, in, 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 in transactions and in your bank account. So the price is not an object. It is not, uh, um, uh, it is not a hindrance, if you like, to it. To, to its use. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I find it very difficult to see that uh, the monetary system uh, in the West will adopt gold um, as part of a new uh, monetary reset. I think that um, the Keynesian approach, the macroeconomic approach of, um, uh, of of our financial and monetary planners in the central banks basically prohibited. They think it is a pet rock. They have got to do so many somersaults in terms of their own intellect that I just don't see them uh, using gold, if you like, as part of a reset monetary system. I think they will probably try and do other things. The SDR, perhaps, is something. But the problem is that if they try and do anything, then I think it is going to fail. 
because um, if you know, money really only works when it is decided between people like you and me what we want to use as a medium of exchange, not when a government which has a system which has failed, you know, then comes back and says, "Oh, we've got another idea." Will you and I, as ordinary economic actors, think that this is something that is going to work or viable or we want to be part of? We will look at this askance, I think, at the very, very least. Um, there is a possibility, however, that um, with the geopolitical situation hotting up between America and China, that China has considerably more physical gold reserves than she is letting on. My estimate is that she's probably got somewhere in the region of 20,000 tons tucked away, not in her official reserves, but in other accounts. If I am right about that, then uh, it is quite easy for China to put her currency onto a gold standard and to have it operate freely as such, because she will have the backing to do it. And, but she will only want to do that at a far higher price of gold. The, I, I don't think that we should consider that as an option at this stage for the very simple reason that it is, if you like, a financial nuclear option. If um, in the financial war between America and China, things hot up to the basis where she feels that she's got to do that, then it really will be a very, very serious uh, situation. That is so interesting. So you feel that China will go to the gold back standard before the United States? Yeah, I think she could do it. Um, I'm not forecasting that she will do it because it is effectively, a, you know, rather like an, um, a financial nuclear bomb. If she did it, it would destroy the dollar. I think it's as simple as that. Oh, wow. Expound upon that for us, please. Well, the problem, as a, as the, the problem uh, uh, that the Western central banks have is that uh, their intellectual approach to, um, uh, to money uh, is uh, effectively a macroeconomic Keynesian approach. They do not understand why gold is so important. There are a few people who we could probably call mavericks, like uh, the Dutch central banker you referred to, <laughs> who actually has the sense to understand that gold is money, not an investment, but money. He does understand that. And he understands that it's money with no counterparty risk. If you've got the physical gold, there is no counterparty risk. That is true, proper money. You talk to anyone, in the Federal Reserve Board about uh, that aspect of money, and they will laugh you out, out of the building. They think this is completely ridiculous. They have to do so many intellectual somersaults to understand the role of gold, if you like. If gold was to be introduced uh, by China into its system, uh, into its monetary system, I just don't see them having the intellectual capacity to be able to respond. And that is why I think that that move, uh, if it happens by China, would be effectively a financial nuclear bomb. And I think it would destroy a lot of the currencies in the West. I mean, there, there are Western nations who have... Um, uh, uh, decent gold reserves, I mean, in theory, but of course we don't know that they're really there because, you know, these people lie through their teeth. And not only that, but there's a lot of double counting going on. But I mean, you know, the Italians and the French have got good gold reserves. The Germans have got good, good gold reserves. I would say about Germany that they're very skeptical about uh, what's going on with the euro. So, you know, it could well be that Germany begins to think in terms of gold reserves but um, I think that it's probably um, an Asian uh, thing. The Asians understand gold. Talk to the Indians, talk to the Indonesians, talk to the Chinese, talk to the Russians, um, talk to any of the Stans. I mean, Turkey, who, with its awful lira, is actually the center for gold trading for the whole of uh, the band into Central Asia, um, you know, in the, in the Muslim world. And uh, then you've got Germany. You've got, you've got Germany, Poland is squeezed in, uh, in between. Those countries have been adding to their gold reserves. They understand that gold is going to have some sort of role. They don't know what it is. But when you have China and Russia uh, and India and, um, you know, all these countries 
being gold-friendly, you begin to think that trade with them in the future may well have an element of gold. And of course, this is also what, what uh, Iran is doing. So interesting. So you put Russia on that list very high also. Well, there is a, a partnership really between uh, China and Russia, a geo geostrategic partnership, which uh, is embodied in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And the members there basically are um, uh, roughly half the world's population. And, um, you know, this is a very serious uh, uh, threat, if you like, to uh, American um, uh, hegemony, uh, you know, the, the, the ability of uh, America to dominate the world, which uh, she thinks that she can do by right. <laughs> you talk, you know, if you talk about these things in America, I'm afraid that, you know, you, you have um, an establishment which really thinks that uh, the world should kowtow to it. Russia and China between them are not going to permit this to happen much more. And I think as things develop, um, I'm afraid that uh, their power in uh, the Eurasian landmass is going to be increasing uh, very much at the expense of the power of, of America. And also, of course, they've got the whole of sub-Saharan Africa involved. Uh, the investment by China in sub-Saharan Africa is in the order of $150 billion. The investment from the West has been 10, 20 billion, if that. Um, and uh, I, th I mean, I'm a bit cynical about it. I think the way it works is that China does the real projects like building the railways and all the rest of it and runs them, by the way, in partnership, sort of, <laughs> with, with the African states. But, um, you know, when we put money in, we put it in as aid and whatever, and it ends up in the politicians' pockets. So, you know, the politicians get it both ways. You know, China are running the country, and they're, they're picking up the bribes. Sorry, that's a bit cynical maybe for... Probably very people. true, Alastair. We know but that. But <laughs> I'm afraid that there is something in that. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's stay with the topic of politics just for a moment. What do you foresee for the upcoming 2020 elections? Well, <laughs> I think I should be asking you. I mean, at this <laughs> distance, I see, um, uh, I, I see the Democratic Party, party you know, having, um, you know, I mean, it, it seems to me it's just a complete mess. I mean, you know, <laughs> they've got so many candidates. You've got far left candidates. You've got Hillary thinking of throwing her hat in the ring, which I think would be very unwise of her. But, you know, that's a personal opinion. Um, Trump, um, I mean, he's, his great, I think his great advantage is that he does uh, appeal to um, the ordinary American, not the American that we talk to on, you know, in sort of in the media or, or whatever, but the guys who just get on with life in the middle of America, you know, the Bible Belt, all that sort of stuff. Um, he understands them. They understand him. But unfortunately, his economics are not at all clever. And um, I think that it's, it's all very well looking at 2020. But if I'm right about um, a slump coming, uh, following a financial crisis, which is in the making now, I think there's quite a lot likely to happen before um, you get you know, you, before you, you get to the point where you're electing another president. So it's, and we've got the same problem with Brexit. I mean, I'm just hoping that this doesn't blow before uh, the end of uh, this month when Brexit is meant to happen. There's a lot of stuff going on, Michelle. Wow. Nutshell that just for us. As, as Americans, we're, we're so focused upon Trump and, and the, the debacle of, <laughs> of the election. Um, yeah. We hear about Brexit, but so you're believing that's going to culminate coming up here? All I will say is that um, the, I mean, we have in uh, Boris Johnson's cabinet um, probably the most intellectually powerful group of politicians we have seen in a long time. Now, that doesn't guarantee success, but um, it is just interesting that they are confident that, they, that, that uh, we will be out on the 31st of October with or without a deal. Uh, and that's the end of this month. Now, Parliament is trying to stop it. Um, so you've got this silly fight going on with Parliament um, uh, ignoring the wishes, if you like, of the electorate in the referendum, which was now three years ago, uh, and uh, trying to change the whole thing. Um, Boris Johnson and his government are determined 
to uh, get Brexit done. Now, the reason that they are determined, quite simply, is that if the Conservative Party fails in this, then it is toast. It really is that serious. Um, they have a plan. We don't know what it is. Um, they have a track record. I mean, if you look at the various people, particularly the uh, chief advisor behind this, a man called Dominic Cummings, he intellectually is of the highest caliber and he understands how to get things done. He understands how to plan, how to outwit the opposition. And it was him, in fact, who led the, um, uh, the, the, the Brexit um, uh, um, uh, referendum um, result, if you like, uh, way back three years ago. You know, it was down to uh, his work that we actually got a Brexit vote. So this is going to be an interesting one. And I think there's, um, I'm not quite sure how they're going to get out of this uh, enormous problem that Parliament has given them. But I suspect that uh, in this case, EU law has primacy over Parliament now, if I'm right in that, then it does mean that uh, when it comes to obeying the law and there is a conflict in the law, then um, uh, th that, that gives, if you like, Boris Johnson a choice. And I think that uh, he will probably go with EU law under which Article 50, um, uh, which, is, which we have invoked in order to go out, uh, under which that was uh, determined. And that being the case, then we could actually leave with or without, a, well, certainly uh, with a deal, but I think um, we could e even leave without a deal against Parliament's wishes. What do you think the result of that is going to be in the United Kingdom? How much of an upset? Well, <laughs> once it's done, it cannot be reversed. That's the important thing. So to a large extent, the argument will die. Uh, there still will be people who, you know, um, sort of still hung up on, you know, we should be, you know, there'll still be the Remainers banging on about it. But basically, it will become history. And then we have a situation where um, a, a, a general election becomes inevitable. Um, the Conservative Party wants a general election. Uh, and uh, once we get that general election, I think uh, the Conservatives will win. They're ahead in the polls. But I think the key thing is that there is only one politician or only one party, but particularly one politician who has um, a positive view on, uh, uh, on this country's prospects, and that's Boris Johnson. The rest of them are either hung up on remaining and are as miserable as toast, <laughs> or alternatively, they're highly socialist. I mean, the Labour Party, which is, the, which is Her Majesty's official opposition, is Marxist. And um, I mean, you know, you, th you think Biden is left wing. Our lot are unreformed Marxist communists. I mean, they've taken over the Labour Party and I just don't see them getting anywhere in an election. My goodness. You know what? You sort of have a reflection of the United States um, because we've become so um, split between um, what seems to be a rising socialist movement that has come out of literally nowhere. I mean, it's only, you know, been three, four years, really, that this has risen, and now it's in front of everyone. So it's happening there, too. Is there a point in history that you would liken this to? Um, well, I can certainly do it in the United Kingdom, and that is before Margaret Thatcher was elected. The Labour Party went extremely left-wing in the late 1970s. I mean, they were as left-wing as they are today. And um, uh, then uh, Margaret Thatcher was elected, and there was a fight against the unions. I mean, you know, the fight continues, if you like, and I'm sure the fight would continue if Boris is re-elected, is elected uh, with a greater majority. But um, I think, you know, the, the, the similarities are, are very significant uh, between then and now. I can't really think of one in America because you had McCarthyism and all the rest of it. So you've never really had that full-blown socialism from either of the two uh, major political parties. It's very interesting. It's actually quite scary, um, to tell you the truth, uh, because of the numbers involved. So it's going to be a very interesting thing to watch. What's your prediction on our election? Do you believe that President Trump is going to hold his seat? 
I don't know. As I said earlier, I think that uh, we're probably looking through um, a credit crisis. Um, we're looking through uh, the global economy um, uh, contracting, going into a slump. Now, if I'm right on that, then who knows what will happen? <laughs> when, now, Alistair, do you, think, do you think that's going to happen before the November elections in 2020? Is that going to happen within one year from now? Well, I would hope not, but um, I think that the problems in the repo market are giving me a signal that things are not quite right. We don't know, but things are not right. And the reason that this uh, matters to me in particular was back in, uh, I think it was December 2007, I happened to be sitting in the, um, in the dealing room of a firm of money brokers in London when suddenly the LIBOR market just ceased trading. There was nobody offering any money wholesale, in the wholesale money market in London. Nobody at all. And nobody understood why. I mean, this is just extraordinary. But it seemed that the, the bank's trading desks were suddenly, you know, they weren't taking on counterparty risk anymore. Now, the LIBOR market, I mean, it was shortly after that that, uh, um, uh, that Northern Rock, which was one of our banks, had to be rescued by the government. Within two months of that actually happening, Northern Rock was nationalized. Now, I don't know what, how timing is going to work, but the one thing I would say is the repo market is a far larger market than LIBOR, because LIBOR is, um, uh, is, is a market where banks lend uh, without taking in collateral. So by definition, it is, if you like, a market which basically eases liquidity. The central bank is always in the background if a bank cannot get liquidity through the LIBOR market. But um, here we have a situation where it's the repo market, which is far, far larger. Instead of talking tens of millions, maybe 100 million overnight money, uh, we're looking in, in, in billions, tens hundreds of billions. I mean, this is a very, very big thing. So if you've got a problem in the repo market, then I think this is a whole different scale from what I saw in 2007. So you can, I think, begin to understand why I'm a little bit worried about what's going on in the background. I don't know. I really don't know. But having had that experience in R.P. Martin's office back in December um, uh, 2007, you can understand why I'm sitting here and looking at the repo market failing. I'm looking at the rates which went up to 10% very briefly. I think this was um, something like 27th, 26th, 27th of uh, September. And we've still got problems. It's not a year end. It's not tax. No, it's something else. And nobody knows what it is. I know what it is, I think, I think. I can't prove it, I think a major bank is in trouble. And it's not an American bank, it's a foreign bank. And the whole situation coincides with the completion of the sale of Deutsche Bank's prime bro brokership to BNP. And you can sell a business, but can you keep the deposits? I don't think so, necessarily. Okay, so it circles back to the beginning of our conversation, um, Deutsche Bank. Yeah, and I think, I mean, basically, um, you know, we've seen they've, they, they've started printing money again. I mean, 60 billion a month and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, if things get worse, then that's going to accelerate. Uh, and so the purchasing power of uh, money, and in this case, we're talking the dollar, is just going to go down and down and down. And um, so I think anyone who wants to protect themselves has got to think about what alternatives do we have to the dollar? And I think the reason that gold and silver have performed so well in recent months is a, you know, a gradual realization that these problems are in the making and um, you know, it's potentially going to get worse. So we better have some on, you know, a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, whatever it is. We haven't had the stampede into gold and silver yet. And again, I come back to cryptocurrencies as a new factor. Bitcoin, I think, is a fascinating story for anyone who in five years' time writes the history of this. So you think Bitcoin could be um, a major player along with gold and silver? Do you think it's that viable? Uh, yeah. The, the, the whole point about Bitcoin is that its supply is very restricted. 
they don't think Bitcoin uh, as such works as money because, um, you know, the rate at which you um, do a payment uh, with Bitcoin is too slow for it to actually operate. But what it can operate as is a store of value. And I come back to the point, you know, in your part of the world, you will have all these young guys and women, young men and women who are into cryptocurrencies and they have learned something which uh, their, um, you know, people of their age in previous cycles just did not know. And that is the fallacy behind fiat currency issued by government without any backing whatsoever. The full faith and credit of the government in the dollar. You know, do you want that or do you want Bitcoin? And their answer is Bitcoin. It's so true because, you know, you're almost afraid to keep your money in banks these days. I mean, there's almost a fear of it. There's not just a hesitancy. There's an actual fear. Is it, is it going to be there the next yeah. day? What's, what's going on well, here? But, but, yeah, there is another aspect to this, Michelle, and that is that, um, you know, in the past, the way things have worked, and I'm going way back and, uh, admittedly, is that, you know, you and I uh, earn some money, um, we spend some of it, we save some of it. And the reason we save some of it is because we know that we're going to need it later on in life or we save it for a particular project or whatever. But the point is that we spend our lives with this mixture and a balance, if you like, between spending and saving. We don't have savers anymore. Instead, we're offered credit. You know, we can go and buy things. And I think I saw a statistic um, uh, earlier this year, whereby 78% of Americans, um, you know, in working working in in, in uh, American enterprises and all the rest of it, 78% of them live paycheck to paycheck. Now that is an extraordinary statement. You don't have savers in your country. We don't have savers in this country. How is that going to affect things? when things begin to fall apart. I think that's a very interesting dimension. It's something um, which perhaps I ought to write on a bit more, in a bit more detail at a later date. But um, that is another thing I think that, that uh, your viewers might like to think about. Absolutely. Now, Alistair, before we go, I want to take a moment to focus in a little bit on your own personal background, because you have successfully risen to very high levels in several organizations financially, and you seem to be coming away with a need to warn people about what is happening. So lay the groundwork for us. Tell us about your own personal background and your personal perspective, and what are the most important things that you have learned throughout your career that you could share with all of us? I want to sort of go with a freeform style here. Talk to us, Alistair. Oh, dear. What can I tell you? Um, I actually started salmon fishing. That was my, my... No, I didn't actually. The first job was I went to sea as a radio officer. And I did that for a few years. And then my father bought a salmon fishery in the west coast of Scotland. So I thought that would be a very nice thing to do. So I did that. And then uh, I had a cousin who um, was a banker in London, and um, uh, he managed to get me a position with a firm of stockbrokers. And so I became a stockbroker. And you learn quite quickly, or you did in those days, this is before stockbrokers employed, you know, very clever people out of university. Um, you know, basically what mattered was that if age 17, you could run in, you know, run around and get prices for someone and do it you know, quickly for your dealer, then that was what mattered, not whether you had a PhD in some, in, in whatever it might be. So it was very much a dealer orientated um, uh, um, uh, way in which things happened. This was before the Big Bang and before big money came into brokers from the banks as they bought out the brokers. Um, and, um, you know, you learned very quickly what was right and what was wrong in terms of basic economics. I mean, we're not, you know, anyone who sat down and sort of tried to um, uh, turn themselves into a Keynesian just ended up being a laughing stock, really. So I started off on the right foot, compared with my university contemporaries who'd been taught economics, and therefore the only way they could understand economics was to unlearn what they had been taught. And of course, most of them don't. <laughs> so so um, that was you know, that was, um, that was fine. Anyway, I enjoyed stockbroking. It worked for me. Um, I became senior partner of my firm at the age of 29. 
Um, and uh, I did that. I was senior partner there for a couple of years. And then um, I was given an opportunity to get involved with investment management, which I did. It was a turnaround. And uh, we turned the business round. Uh, we got some performance back into the funds, which I thoroughly enjoyed. It was the first time I'd ever dreamt dealt in American stocks. And I had a rather <laughs> an interesting way of doing it, but it worked. Um, I just thought, right, I've got to compete, you know, <laughs> and you compete. So that was, that was, um, that was very interesting. And then um, I did a certain amount of corporate finance work when uh, the internet um, uh, became uh, interesting, if you like, as far as the stock market is concerned. We we had a, a change in the laws which set up uh, a junior market. So I was bringing companies to this junior market. Um, that was great. And then I went um, and lived in Guernsey for a while, which is um, uh, offshore. Uh, it's an offshore financial centre, uh, and uh, learned how that world work works. Uh, I worked as a consultant and became a director of a bank there. Um, and then I came back here to retire, but I can't retire. You know, I just write and I enjoy it. And I got to know James Turk from Gold Money, um, and he suggested that um, I start writing for Gold Money, which, uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, it's just just wonderful. I mean, it's it's a lovely company. The people are nice. The people are good. Um, what the, comp the, the company's objectives are exactly what I believe in, and that is we have got to provide an avenue for people to protect their, um, their money. We've got to you know, make them understand what money really is. Gold is money. It is not an investment. We get that message over. And we provide uh, custody facilities outside the banking system uh, for, I think at the moment, we've got something like $2.2 billion dollars worth of assets in custody for our customers. Um, and also, uh, we provide um, a means whereby you can use that as cash by using a pre-loaded debit card. Uh, and we can do that in a number of currencies and so on. So, yeah, I mean, it's um, as far as I'm concerned, gold money, I think, is uh, a really sensible um, uh, way, if you like, of dealing with the future rather than uh, having your money stuck in a bank, which may well go bust. You know, here, um, we act as custodians. I mean, in, 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 in original banking theory, we act rather like a deposit-taking bank, which does not take those deposits away from a safe custody function and lend them out to someone else. Yeah, so, now this is something in our world which we haven't seen, but I can tell you, if you go way back um, throughout the history of banking, there have been times when banks actually just took deposits. Inevitably, what happens is that someone cheats along the way <laughs> and lends that money out to someone really? else. You know, but anyway, we, we act as custodians and... Um, it's, it's rather like a sort of brokerage business, if you like, but, but uh, you know, we just try and de-risk everything so that you actually own your gold, except you've probably got it in a, a vault of your choosing. Um, in your case, I mean, it could be London, it could be Zurich, it could be Singapore, it could be Dubai, it could be Toronto, wherever. You know, we've got, I think, about a dozen vaults around the world which uh, people use. Yeah, I want everyone to understand the magnitude of the precious metals that you deal with and um, really check into this because it's one of the most extraordinary ways to protect ourselves for what's coming up. You also, as you mentioned, deal in every type of currency, which is very interesting these days. You can um, have your debit card and have your currency in euros or Swiss francs or the USD or whatever you need, and you can switch it back and forth, right? Yes, absolutely. So, um, I mean, you say that this is sort of unusual in a sense. It's not, actually. The history is that gold is money. All the rest is temporary. I mean, the no-fiat currency has, exist, has, has survived, if you like, throughout history. You look back, um, you had the French Assignat um, at the time of the revolution. And when that collapsed, they decided to issue the uh, Mandat Territorial, which um, was uh, you know, to replace the collapsing currency, and that collapsed within six months. <laughs> you know, if you look at all the currency collapses that have occurred, I mean, or the inflations, it's always been uh, with paper currencies. 
there have been other problems in the past. I mean, in, 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 in England, uh, at the time of Henry the first, uh, there was an inflation, but the inflation was basically because uh, people called the moneyers. These are the people who were given the the honorary right to coin money, and they would coin it on behalf of the king and up and down the country. But of course, um, and they weren't paid to do it, so it was an honorary position. So it was hardly surprising when they thought they were trying to earn a bit on the side by, um, you know, if you like, taking the silver out of the coins. <laughs> and debasing them that way. Um, and, uh, but the whole thing blew up because there was a bad harvest and with the combination of the shortage of food. And remember, in those days, people basically lived basically to eat and they hadn't got anything else. So, um, you know, the poor, you know, there was, there was enormous hardship and starvation through a combination of uh, l lack of cereals and uh, prices going through the roof due to the, due to the lack of cereals and also due to um, uh, uh, the extra amount of money, debased money in circulation. Anyway, they dealt with that in, in Winchester, I think in about 1220-ish, 1225, I think when they got all the money is down to Winchester and um, uh, the ones that were found guilty had their right hands chopped off and another part of their anatomy which um, is a bit unmentionable on television. So it, it worked. <laughs> wow, that's quite the deterrent. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Yeah, and I mean, it's something that I think our, our central bankers, um, you know, I sort of begin to think that uh, central bankers uh, for getting us in this mess yeah, perhaps there ought to be some penalty there, but I'm not quite sure what it would be. <laughs> <laughs> Your wealth of knowledge is so extraordinary, and I um, wanted everyone to understand um, how much wealth you deal with right now and the fact that you are so aware that this is cyclical. This is something that's gone on through thousands of years. Currencies go up, and then they fail. They go up, and then they fail, and then they have people stealing the metal and, and so on and so forth. So we're just, we're just in another cycle. We're, it's just that at this moment in time, we're yeah. at the end of this one and everyone should protect themselves. Absolutely. Yes. Alistair, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everybody how they can follow your work. Well, uh, if you log into uh, www.goldmoney.com and look for research and under their insights, I write an article which is published every Thursday afternoon EST, uh, and I write a market report on Friday, which again is published. I write it in the morning, so I'm probably overtaken by events by the time it's published. Um, and that's, uh, again, after, afternoon on Friday, Eastern Standard Time. So um, d just bookmark goldmoney.com uh, slash insights, and you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming back on the show today. That's very much my pleasure. Mr. Alistair McLeod, expert economist and head of research at goldmoney.com. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.